So, and then he sold everything for about 250 million dollars or euros, was it? Yeah, euros. Right, okay. Right. I mean, but bear in mind, yeah. you know, there was leverage on all this, there yeah. were partners, there were... You gotta pay them all off, I think. Okay. Gotta pay them all off. That's not what I took home. So, right. Okay. But, <clears throat> you know, um, so we wound all that down and then it took us a couple of years to kind of switch the lights off. And, right. Uh, so I was really gone by 2010. How old were you then? 40, 48, 49. Oh, wow, okay, wow, okay, okay. So, I mean, now it brings you, so you, you as a shape the start and then fantastic ending. So what, what do you do, what do you do now? You're in England now, you're based in Oxford. So what's your plans now, you know, what's, what's important for you? Well, building value, f solving problems, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I like solving problems, you know, I like the next adventure. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we are here in England as well as Europe, but we are, we are in a confluence of problems. There's a, there's an overarching housing crisis, shortage. Yeah. There's a lot of stock on the market, but it's the wrong kind of stock. So, you know, we need statistically, you know, 300,000 homes or whatever it is a year. Okay. <clears throat> That's not being met. Um, people have been building the wrong stuff for a long time, thinking there were a lot of rich people, but they're mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got the housing problem, you've got the liquidity, you've got the funding problem. Yeah. So if you're going to build all this stuff, you basically need 200 billion over the next 10 years. Wow. In the market. Okay. The clearing banks have retreated. They're not lending on, on development finance basically anymore. Um, so 20, 30 million billion a year has come off the market there. Wow. Um, you've had a lot of peer to peer lenders and online platforms and stuff come into that space to fill that gap. But, Still, that's only six, seven billion. And a lot of these guys, they're tech guys, they're marketing guys, you know, they're not real estate guys. And, you know, development, even in the best of times, is a tricky business. Right. Okay. And box tick lending for development is um, very tricky. Okay. You know, to get it right. So I think what you'll see now as the market shifted is that. Um, a lot of capital has been put out in the market, not recklessly, but without without the proper underwriting and due diligence. So you've got GDBs that are softening, and a lot of these loan books are in default. <clears throat> you know, and and um, developers that started stuff in 2016, 17, things that are coming to completion now um, are being choked by sort of rolled up interest falling GDVs, extended sales periods. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, they're not really thinking about profit anymore. They're, they're looking at the clock. Right. Okay. Um, so I think <clears throat> there's some opportunity there. Um, and then of course you've got, you know, the problem or the solution or part of the solution is, you know, you've got a retail capital market that's got 600 billion in sitting in cash ISAs or 300 and some billion cash ISIS sitting around earning less than one and a half percent interest. And, you know, I mean, if the government would just simply allow that capital to, to move freely to solve the problem, a lot of this problem could be solved overnight. But, you know, that's a whole different story. Yeah. But anyway, so I like solving problems. I'm, an, I'm a property developer, an equity guy. And, um, you know, we can't, my partners and I came together and thought, well, how do we, how do we how do we help to try to solve these problems, or how do we pull these things together to make a difference? And one of the things that you know that we're very passionate about is helping SME developers. And when I say SME, I'm really kind of talking about the small S in the SME. Okay. Um, you know, the guys that probably are good at what they do, which is build stuff, but maybe not so good at structuring pa financial packages and deals and putting together the right, you know, funding. And so that's where we feel we come in and we can add a lot of value based on our experience, but also bring capital to the table. We're not bringing equity. We're bringing, we're bringing capital in the form of debt. Okay. So it's, it's very basically, um, 
um, a capital stack which is very aggressive. Right. Um, what does that mean? Can you speak for the well, you know, as well? Yeah. You, you, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're if you're a, if you're a developer, yeah, you got to piece together the capital stack, and that's going to be equity, equity, yeah, senior, yeah, and mes, mes yeah. Um, and at any point in time, any of those components can hiccup, yeah, and 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 mm -hmm. fall out, which means that you're going to have to start all over again. Yeah. Um, also, you've got to negotiate all the intercreditor agreements and you've got costs and legals and so rather than piece all that together yourself we kind of look our, at ourselves as being a one-stop shop okay and if you compare the two basically even with our because we're very aligned with the developer a great percentage of our return comes from the success of the project yeah so our alignment is not so much on can you pay the interest and in, you know we're not really a pure lender we're more of a partner um, our alignment is for you to succeed yeah uh, and we want you to succeed because if you succeed then our returns are, are better right and your returns are better so if you don't succeed we're just a very cheap source of debt finance right okay um, <clears throat> so so from that point of view we think we're, we're unique because we're providing capital at maybe 150 to 200 basis points, slightly higher okay. than if you would be able to piece all this together. But if you do that and you're lucky, it might take you six months. Right. Okay. So what? Sorry. <coughs> some 150 basis point. What does that mean so for the audience? What does that mean percentage wise? Interest rates. So, so uh, you might be able to piece all this together for your cost of capital might be 12 and a half percent. Let's yeah, say. Yeah. So our cost of capital to you, all, everything in is probably about fourteen percent. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So basically, majority of the money you will get back is at the back end of the project. Most of it. Yeah. Because, and if if the project is successful, everybody gets more yeah. than okay. Right. Okay. That's right. So, I mean, I I know a number of people in the Midlands. Uh, and, and um, the north as well. Say if the developers and they want to reach out to you, mm -hmm. uh, what's the um, what's the, what's the best way of getting hold of you? I think by email initially, yeah. and then we'll, and then we'll reach out to them. So <clears throat> you know we're we're rebranding our company. It's it's going to change from Hauser Oberschneider to actually Hilltop Credit Partners. Okay. So it's going to be info at. Yeah, hilltopcreditpartners.com. We put that in the link below as well. Okay. And generally, you know, a lot of people contact me first, so I'll pass the information up to you guys. Okay, so Paul, um, I mean, I just should add that our sweet spot basically is yeah. sort of between, you know, <clears throat> we don't really want to be competing at the lower end of the market. Um, that's a very competitive part of the market, very broker driven, very very rate driven um so we're probably not very eager to do much of anything under two and a half three million pounds okay okay and that's kind of our starting point okay up to up to 20. okay yeah we'll obviously look at the developers experience as well yeah, of course. Like that, and the project yeah. and you've got your own valuers and yeah. they can they will look at the project and do their due diligence before yeah no of course i mean Obviously, we, we have our own panel of QSs and monitoring surveyors that we use, um, or that we will be using, but we have our own team here um, that'll run through desktop valuations, we'll go meet with the developer, we'll look at the site, <coughs> we'll kick the tires, we'll, we'll see if we like the project. Okay. I mean, we've got to like it, the, the deal's got to stack, yeah. and um, if it does, then we'll take it to the next stage. Yeah. Okay. And are you looking at any particular cities or are you <coughs> geographically agnostic as they say? You know? <coughs> well, geographically agnostic. We like the M1 corridor for sure. M1 corridor, okay. <coughs> Going up. Okay. So all the way up to Birmingham and okay. you know, above. So, yeah. you know, we do like that. Um, there are certain sectors that are probably, I might consider to be a bit hot right now. Right. So we might leave those alone. but. You know, generally, most most of our focus is going to be outside of London. Okay, yeah. right, okay. Um, 
So, so I've heard you speak a couple of times. And yesterday, I heard you speak again at the Canary Wharf, and uh, it was a great speech. Uh, I really enjoyed myself. Um, one thing that's quite, quite, um, quite informative was that you feel that is a because of people's wages. Yeah, there's a sweet spot for the end product that they would buy. So well, if people approach you and say, oh, we've gone to Birmingham, we can develop housing for £500,000, that's not what you're looking for. What's the kind of sweet spot for the, not to do the whole project, but setting up the, the house or the apartment, what kind of selling prices? Well, I think <clears throat> developers have to <clears throat> kind of back into this um, a little bit differently. I mean, there's been a lot of stuff built for, you know, £1,000 a square foot. And, right. I mean, to be honest, I mean, yeah. nobody can afford that. Right. So, yeah. I mean, we're looking at the more affordable stuff. Um, we're very selective. We're, we're cautious, but we're optimistic. Yeah. Um, and um, so if you look at medium family income, what a bank will lend against um, that income coupled with help to buy, um, you know, how much can it... How much can a how much could a, a family afford? Yeah, and there's a number. There's a number for that. You yeah. know, whether it's in the in the regions or whether it's in London. Obviously, London is higher because yeah. the medium income level is higher. Yeah. So you know that's what developers need to be building to. Um, See, so that's a great point. So I don't think many people think like that. They don't think work back like you did, and I thought. Because some people I know in Birmingham, uh, they are building flats for, for half a million, I think like that, yeah. And, but I don't think they've done the research uh, that you've done. Um, mm, interesting, okay. You know, if you're trying to sell flats into a market, you better be sure that you can sell them. So yeah. people need to be able to afford them. And, you know, if that means that you don't build today because there's nothing you know, you can't make the deal stack, well yeah. then, then don't build. Okay, right. So, again, maybe a bit of advice for the audience. So how do you feel, so what you're dealing with, say Hilltop, yeah? So, yeah, Hilltop. Um, what's your strategy regarding Brexit? You know, how does that affect how you operate, how you plan to operate? Well, no one knows what the, yeah. the end result of that's going to be, so I don't want to <clears throat> pontificate here, but yeah. um, it doesn't change the fact that the you know the the UK needs a certain amount of housing. Yeah. Anyway, so that's not going to change. Yeah. Um, the funding gap is not going to change. Yeah. What may change is GDVs may change. Values may go down yeah. further. Um, costs may go up. I mean, okay. you know, if people are worried about stockpiling, let's say, insulin from Europe because of what Brexit's going to bring, right? what's going to happen with German windows? Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, or doors. Yeah. You know, most of the material that we get yeah. is from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you might see a blip in cost inflation okay so development budgets might change and you just I think we need to all be open-minded and see what happens you know I don't think anybody knows okay right but you've got your numbers and you, you, yeah you know your parameters okay yeah okay Paul so I'm fascinated by the actual the entrepreneurs their mindset what do they do differently because for example if somebody else was in your position when you landed in uh, in Estonia, you know what made you so different? Because I'm sure somebody else would have done nothing, you know, or went on holiday yet. So wh why were you? You know, what was your mindset like? That um... well, I wasn't thinking like that at all. I, mean, yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't thinking of building anything. Right. Yeah. Um, first of all, I had nothing to lose. Right. Okay. <coughs> right. Except for time. Yeah. Um, I had nothing better to do. Right. So, you know, I think when you start from that place, you can do a lot. You take more risks. You, you, yeah. Because you're not concerned about 
the downside. Right. Okay. You know, there was no downside. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's only now that there's downside, and now you know you you evaluate things a little bit differently. Right. Um, but back then there was really no plan. I mean, I think entrepreneurs generally always want to like get stuck into a problem and figure out a solution. Right. Um, and and that's always kind of been my mindset. And you know, I've never liked working for people. Right. Um, I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about that. Right. So, yeah. so I think entrepreneurs generally are like that. They're a bit, they're, they test and challenge the system. Okay. Um, they're not comfortable being told what to do. Right. Um, they just want to crack on with things. Um, I will say that there's one, there's one element of this that actually probably allowed me to scale a lot faster than would other. I would have otherwise been able to do. And if you remember in the beginning of our conversation, I said that, you know, I arrived in these, this place and I didn't speak the language. Well, I didn't speak Latvian either. And I didn't speak Lithuanian. I don't speak Ukrainian. I don't speak um, Polish. And because of that handicap, I was actually forced not intentionally, but just because I had to, I was forced to delegate right. everything right. Okay. to people. Yeah. So I had to sort of trust the system. Right. You know, and I had to, so if you were working with me and yeah. you were my colleague and you were responsible for Poland or whatever, I, d I had to believe that you were going to get that done. Right. Okay. You know, and so obviously we communicated about that, but I wasn't in your face every day. Right. You didn't micromanage them. I, I didn't micromanage. And if I'd been in an environment where I spoke the language, mm -hmm. I might have micromanaged everything because right. that's what entrepreneurs like to do. Yeah. <clears throat> but I didn't have the luxury of doing that. Right. So my handicap actually became my biggest asset. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so, you know, Real estate, like any other business, is about leverage. Right, yeah. <clears throat> it's about leveraging capital, it's about leveraging resources, it's about leveraging people. Mm -hmm. um, and we, as well as the capital, we leverage our, 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 our staff okay, yeah. as much as we could. So we gave people big responsibilities right. and counted on them to get it done. To get it done. Yeah. So, uh, I read a lot of books, one of the books I read is uh, Why Sell Tacos in Africa, so that's by Paul, and uh, every time I get something out of it, <laughs> so, um, and one thing I learned recently was, you know, again, about delegate, I know you said yours was, you were supposed to delegate, but uh, one last time I thought, I'm going to let the manager do the managing, you know, and I stepped out, and I felt, much better about myself mm. and a bit more freer uh, to pursue other things. So, um, tell me again a bit more about your habits. Okay, H have you got any sort of morning routines that you do? Are you go in the morning, you're okay, right? Okay, not really. Okay, uh, you don't do any meditation, jogging, or uh, affirmations in the morning. No, okay. No. Uh, so, see, what about your evening uh, routines? Anything? Not really. Okay. You know, I do. I do a lot of. I create a lot of lists. I create a lot of. Uh, <clears throat> I do a lot of planning, and I do a lot of thinking at night, right? Um, before bed, about sort of the day, the week, you know, what's you know what I'm going to do, and you know. Okay. So I'm very much an org. I'm, I'm very organized from that point of view. Okay. You know? um, so, have you now? Got on, got in like a mentor to take you to the next level. Is that how you do? You like to work with mentors at all? I've not. No, no. Uh, I'm in the past. Mm. Um, I know. I know. Lots of people talk about that. Yeah. Um, I've never really. I've never really had one. Um, so I'm probably not the right person to ask about that. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Busy. Okay. Um, what would, what, who do you think about, or what do you think about when you hear, you hear the word success? What does that remind you of, 
you simply oh he's successful you know what does that mean to you success balance and mm -hmm. happiness you mm -hmm. know it's not yeah i mean money's a part of it but yeah. it's it's just about feeling comfortable in your own skin okay yeah okay um If I could ask you a weird question, uh, what's your spirit animal? What would that be? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be a lion or, or a bear. <laughs> okay. I mean, maybe a lion, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, so, knowing what you know now, yeah. uh, obviously you've had a lot of success. And, and, and Which is not much, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, what would be the advice you would give to, say, a 30-year-old Paul? What advice would you give to them? Do more. Mm -hmm. Think bigger. Right, okay. So, bigger than two to fifty million dollars? Think bigger. Right, okay. If it worked once, yeah. do it ten times. Okay. Um, so, again, what do you think? I know you've written another book recently as well. Um, so you you wrote Why Sell Tacos in Africa yeah. about three four years ago. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, are there any sort of uh, are there are there still blue sky opportunities left? Do you think? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, I think it's about solving problems, right? It's, yeah. You know, I mean. You don't have to travel across the world to find an opportunity. Right, okay. Yeah. So one of the opportunities obviously we talked about is Hilker. Yeah. Hilker. yeah. Okay, right, okay. Um, what's the best piece of advice someone's given you? Do more. Do more, okay. okay. What's the worst piece of advice someone's given you? Don't do it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so Paul, I really want to thank you for your time. <coughs> thank you. Uh, and I know I think we've been trying to we've been talking to each other for about a year now, mm. and uh, I've heard you speak a couple of times as well. I've read your books. Um, I really want really to thank you for your time. What's the final message you want to give to the audience? What what what's, what message you give to the audience? Goodness, mm. you know. I mean, if you've got an idea, just. Pursue it. If it's not working, change it. Right. Okay. You know, it's all about taking that first step, isn't it? Yeah. You know, most people freeze because they don't have all the pieces. Yeah. You know, so they think, oh, I got to get this perfect. I need this in place. I need that in place. You're never going to know what those questions are unless you start. Right. So I think you just have to start. You know, you got to get out there and don't look down. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just oh. don't look down. I think your journey just shows that once you take the first step, other doors open. Yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. And people show up to help you. Yeah. Okay. When the time is right. Right. Okay. So. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please, please like and share this video. If you've got any questions, put them downstairs in the comment box, and we'll we'll put a link in to Paul's Paul's business venture and if you are a uh, small developer, small to medium developer and you're looking, you've got some projects that do need funding, uh, email, yeah, I'll get yeah. in touch with me or in, straight to info Paul. at yeah. hilltopcreditpartners.com. Okay and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Great. How's that Paul? That was fun.